yeah. I'll say something about the historical relationship between uh, cosmology and the belief in extraterrestrial uh, life, and um, uh, which is a kind of a prehistory of uh, what is uh, today known as astrobiology, exobiology, but classically is known as pluralism, uh, meaning the belief of a hypothesis that there is life, not necessarily at once life, but that there is life all over uh, in the universe. Some of you may be familiar uh, with the work uh, in the middle, a um, uh, fairly famous but also fairly controversial book uh, by John Barrow and uh, Frank Chipler, which uh, effectively introduced uh, the entropic cosmological principle uh, in which life uh, plays a, a central role. But I will also uh, mention a uh, work by two of the people who happen to be here. Uh, one is myself. I wrote a couple of years ago uh, a book with the title Higher Speculations, in which I deal with various fundamental uh, physical theories and have a chapter on anthropic science and a chapter on astrobiology and physical eschatology. And uh, even more recently, uh, Clément Vidal has written a book, The Beginning and the End, uh, The Meaning of Life in a Cosmological uh, Perspective. But before I come to that, I'll, I, I would like to give a very brief and very impressionistic account uh, of some of the ideas uh, from the past. Um, and I want to uh, emphasize that we don't have to go very far back in time uh, until ideas like these were, uh, if not commonly accepted, then certainly accepted. So in the early Victorian period, uh, meaning the uh, mid-19th century, um, it was still considered respectable science to believe that uh, being somewhat like us, but clearly different, uh, populated um, the uh, the parts of the planetary system. This illustration is meant to, well, it's a fanciful illustration, of course, but it's meant to, um, it, it, it's, it's a proposal of what the Lunarians, the inhabitants of the moon, look, might look like. However, 50 years later, at the turn of the century, um, this kind of uh, speculation, science fiction spe speculations, had uh, changed and um, astronomers uh, were not very keen on the idea of extraterrestrial intelligences, which I would like, which I can um, illustrate by one of the classical cases in this uh, history, the famous postulate or the claim of the American astronomer Percival, Percival Lovell, uh, who in the early 20th century uh, believed that he had seen uh, the remnants of Martian canals, and he suggested that if the Martians still didn't exist, then certainly they had existed, and the Martian civilization must have been very highly advanced to um, build these uh, enormous structures in such a short time. And of course, his claim, um, or his speculations, aroused a lot of media interest but it's characteristic that professional astronomers and physicists receive the news uh, with a great deal of skepticism. Most of them simply rejected the claim. Others uh, uh, preferred just to uh, ignore these kind of speculations. So for a period of time, uh, until well after World War II, uh, extraterrestrials were not counted as part of respectable uh, astronomy. That changed, however, in the 1960s, or about that period, uh, in which we, for various reasons I cannot come into, uh, have the first more or less scientifically based, certainly claimed to be scientific, uh, ideas of searching for extraterrestrial intelligences with the so-called CT programs, which were part of um, accepted uh, scientific enterprise insofar that uh, they were NASA uh, sponsored. So we have with, um, with various people from that period, uh, Americans like Carl Sagan and um, 
Frank Drake, but also people from Russia, such as uh, Joseph Sklowski, a number of uh, respected scientists who tried to uh, promote that kind, new kind of, of uh, what we would call uh, astrobiology today. Um, uh, it's from the same period that we have uh, the first, um, uh, what shall we call them, estimates uh, of uh, trying to find uh, these kind of uh, extraterrestrials uh, and to communicate with them. The, Fre the Drake equation uh, dates from uh, 1960 and uh, since then it has served as a kind of a guideline or a survey of uh, the possibility to find not any kind of life in the universe, of course, but because the, the Drake equation is concerned with civilizations which are so highly advanced that we can communicate with them by means of radio signals. And it still uh, functions like a framework for this kind of things, and the CETI programs, of course, are still running. Um, I'm not going to this famous equation, but just mention that it has not changed uh, dramatically. Some of the factors has um, become better known, especially after the discovery, the recent discovery of a multitude of exoplanets. But some of the other probability factors, the only thing we know about them is really that they are between zero and 100%. Um, but uh, I would like uh, for the rest of my talk uh, to uh, focus on cosmology because what I have said so far is not really cosmology, it's uh, astronomy. The first time, well, the, 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 um, the central question, uh, one of the central questions in this debate which I very briefly sketched, is not concerned with whether or not there's life elsewhere in the universe. It's not concerned with the origin of life. It's concerned with the only kind of advanced life that we know for sure exists, meaning humans. No? Yes. <laughs> it seems to be, it doesn't work. Sorry, it's it, probably it, the, uh, the battery do you have, yes? Okay. Uh, so, so, uh, so this central question, which people have asked themselves for millennia, of course, uh, is concerned with the fate of the human race. Uh, meaning, will life as we know it um, s at some point cease to exist? Will it be exterminated uh, or will life go on forever, not necessarily on the Earth, but somewhere in the universe. This kind of question was first put in a somewhat scientific perspective in uh, the last part of the 19th century. Um, so I'll briefly refer to a very important, a very interesting debate, which uh, will probably be unknown to most of you. The laws of thermodynamics and especially the second law dates from the mid 19th century. The second law of thermodynamics is unique among the fundamental laws of physics by being the only law in which there is an inbuilt time direction. And uh, very shortly after this law had been um, introduced by Clausius and, and, and other people, uh, it led to the hypothesis of the so-called heat death in German Wärmetod, uh, which in a sense is very simple. Uh, we know that entropy always, that it never decreases, it always increases in a closed system, and it, it's reasonable to assume that the universe is a closed system, so the entropy will uh, continually increase in the universe. The entropy is a measure of disorder or lack of structure, so at some time in the far future, there will be no structure at all. And of course, there will be no life either. This um, prophecy, scientific, scientifically based prophecy, led to a heated debate in Europe and uh, North America uh, in the last uh, part of the 19th century. Uh, it was a debate which was primarily um, discussed by philosophers, theologians, and social critics, but also by a few um, 
by a few uh, scientists. Here's a, just a sample of the enormous literature, the German literature in this case, and um, uh, some of it is a bit interesting um, because, as you can see, um, the second law was used, directly used, uh, in a theological context. It was used as a proof for the existence of God. The, uh, the law of entropy and the ship for device, the proof of God, or the proof of a, cre of a creator, and you can see it here, the Gottes Beweis hat Grund des Entropiesatzes, the proof of God on, base, on the basis of the law of entropy. It is possible, and the argument is not very complicated, uh, to argue uh, from the second law, from the cosmological version of the second law, that there must have been a beginning of the universe. If there has been a beginning, uh, presumably the universe was created. If it was created, there presumably must have been a creator. And what could this creator be except God? Um, the the uh, prophecy of a heat death, meaning the end of the universe in a certain sense, and certainly the end of all activity and all life, was something which concerned people. Um, not only the philosophers and the theologians, whose business it is to be concerned with things like that, uh, but also uh, some of the uh, very prominent uh, a scientist in this period, so I'll very briefly uh, refer to these three citations. All three scientists are extremely well known. Um, the uh, argument for the heat death was first spelled out uh, explicitly by Hermann von Helmholtz in a famous speech he gave in Königsberg, the present Kaliningrad, it's not so far from here, the birthplace of Immanuel Kant, and well, by the way, and as you can see from this uh, famous speech, he argues uh, essentially from the second law uh, that there will come a time when the life of men, animals, and plants could not, of course, continue. Um, this was a prediction or a prophecy which uh, caused a great deal of disturb. Um, one of those who was very much disturbed about it was none other than Charles Darwin. We know that um, from his autobiography, which was published only after his death. But he writes in this uh, biography as that he finds it intolerable that there will come a time when all life is annihilated. And there's no doubt that he was referring to the physicist uh, prediction of, of the heat death. Many other people found it equally intolerable. Uh, so it's a it's, uh, of course not all people, but many people felt and do feel that it is intolerable that mankind, you, humanity, will at some time disappear. This clearly is an emotional or a philosophical desideratum. It's completely non-scientific, but it's um, important nonetheless. And in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Sven Arrhenius the famous uh, Swedish um, chemist, Nobel laureate of 1903, one of the founders of physical chemistry, a versatile scientist who all, also dealt with cosmological matters. He and many other people tried to uh, circumvent the tyranny of the second law by coming up with scenarios which e either denied the, cos the cosmological val validity of the second law or came up with counter-entropic ideas, meaning ideas which um, countered the growth in entropy. And um, Arrhenius did come up with such uh, ideas. They were not generally accepted. And of course, the second law is still, to this day, I believe to have um, a general uh, validity. Uh, one of the ways of um, preserving life in, in, in eternity is to assume that uh, the universe evolved cyclically or in an oscillatory uh, manner, which is an idea which can be followed uh, through a very long time. I'll uh, have to do this uh, briefly and go over, because um, uh, cosmology, of course, experience a watershed 
and about 1920. Since then, uh, cosmology has basically been a, a study which is theoretically based on Einstein's uh, cosmological field equations of 1917. These equations, as it turned out in the 1930s, describe uh, dynamic models of the universe. And from the early 1930s, it was known that they are basically, and still is known, that there's basically two ways in which a, a universe can evolve. Uh, one of them is there's enough matter and energy in the universe uh, the curvature will be positive, and then from the Big Bang, uh, eventually gravity will take over, and uh, the universe will end in uh, what is sometimes called a big crunch, and that's it. General rel relativity um, only has something to say between the Big Bang and the big crunch. Uh, a proper a cyclic universe where these cycles continue cannot be described by general relativity alone. But if you make certain re revisions or introduce certain assumptions, it can be made. And then we have this situation which has appealed to many cosmologists uh, that although there is an end and a beginning, these ends and this beginning can be traced indefinitely far back and indefinitely uh, in the future. And some uh, cosmologists, both in the past and, and now, uh, has referred to the uh, endless existence of life in this respect, such as you can see from uh, these two quotations, which are fairly uh, modern. But this kind, of, um, uh, uh, this kind of cosmological model is presently ruled out for observational reasons. Uh, we are pretty sure that uh, this is not the way in which the universe evolves. Um, uh, but in order to emphasize this, um, this um, emotional desideratum of endless life, I, I would like to illustrate it uh, with two further examples. Um, one of them is Paul Dirac, uh, very well known as uh, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, Nobel Prize for his fundamental ideas in that area, of course, but Dirac, uh, which is probably less well known, also dealt with cosmology in the late 1930s. Uh, he came up with um, a very unorthodox uh, cosmological models based on the hypothesis that the constant of gravitation is not a true constant, but that it decreases slowly in cosmic time. And he based this uh, idea uh, on certain um, combinations of natural constants these two combinations of natural constants, T naught is the Hubble time, which is essentially the age of the universe. The other symbols have a standard meeting. Um, and they are very large numbers, and they are dimensionless, meaning that they don't depend on the particular unit with that, that we use, and they happen to be of the same order of magnitude. What Dirac called the large number hypothesis was that these two numbers must be closely related. Um, and from this he devised the particular cosmological model. What is of interest in this context is that Dirac explicitly uh, said that he preferred a cosmological model which would allow the possibility of endless life. And we know from his uh, private notes and his diaries, which he wrote as a younger man, that he was very much attached throughout his life uh, to the same kind of thinking that Darwin experienced I believe that the human race will continue to live forever and will develop and progress without lim limit. Of course, Dirac, Dirac knew very well that this was just that, a belief. And he knew very well that perhaps the fundamental laws of physics do not comply with the wishes and beliefs of humans. Um, uh, another example, if we go uh, up, as you probably know, uh, for about 15 years, the uh, so-called Big Bang Relativity cosmology was challenged by a very powerful um, uh, and very different program, the steady-state cosmology, which was proposed in 1948 by Fred Hoyle, Herman Bundy, and Tommy Gold. The steady-state, as the name says, uh, according to the steady-state model, the universe has no beginning, it has no end. It has always existed and in basically the same shape uh, and matter is continuously uh, produced such that the average density of matter in the universe 
in spite of its uh, expansion, uh, remains the same. And you can see that uh, Fred Hoyle, back in 1948, uh, mentioned the possibility of endless life not as a basic argument for his cosmological model, but as an additional argument why it, not that it might be, it should be true, but that it was more appealing than other models. And we know uh, from other people, Dennis Sharma, a very influential and famous astrophysicist and cosmology, he said explicitly that, and he worked within the program of steady state cosmology for about um, 15 years or so, and his basic reason why that here we have a model uh, which uh, includes the possibility of endless uh, life, which other models uh, do not. So, um, so uh, just at the very end, physical eschatology, uh, that's, that's a strange name, of course, um, about, and it's a modern name, but the idea is, is that just as we have an eschat eschatological scenarios in the Bible, we can base eschatology on the laws of physics or cosmology. Uh, so uh, so uh, according to, to modern knowledge, and um, <coughs> this is a sketch of the various possibilities of uh, the evolution of the universe uh, from a modern point of view. Uh, as you know, um, for about less than 20 years ago, people discovered the so-called acceleration of the universe, and, um, which means that uh, it's the red curve, which is the one which fits best, and the only one, in fact, which fits, fits with, uh, with observation. So people today are absolutely sure that this is the way the universe will uh, evolve in the future. Um, it's called the Lambda CDM um, a program or, or theory. Lambda stands for the uh, Einstein's cosmological constant, which is believed to be the constant which is responsible for the dark energy. So the best, in a certain sense best, scientifically sense best, but from all other points of view, not the best, offer for the very far future of the universe is that it will continue to expand, it will expand forever, and it will expand faster and faster, and the entire universe will be filled not by matter, not by normal energy, but by dark energy, which means, of course, that all structures will be lost, and there will be no end to it. In a certain sense, the universe will continue to exist, um, but there's no way that it can create life or activity of any uh, kind at all. Um, and that is the kind of scenarios which are discussed within a so-called physical, um, uh, physical uh, eschatology by, by, by a number of people. Um, which, and, and these people, I mean, what these people do is that they use the fundamental laws of physics as we know them which means basically general relativity and then the standard model, uh, possibly in some mo modified version, and then they made huge extra extrapolations on the basis of these laws. And when I say extrapolations and when, when I say the far future, I mean the far future. There are people who, ha who have calculated what the universe will look like, not in 10 billion or 100 billion years from now, but 10 to the power of 100 years from now. And they, the kind of universe at that time is not very inviting. Um, but time doesn't allow me to go uh, any further, and there's no reason for it, uh, by the way, because in some of this literature to which I referred, uh, you can find um, all the kind of information and all the kind of speculations um, which, uh, to which I referred. So, so the bottom line is to repeat that um, the existence of life in the universe, and intelligent life in particular, continue to play a small role in cosmology. It's not a big role, I should emphasize that, uh, but it's still there and it probably will forever be part of uh, cosmologists' uh, thinking uh, about the universe. Thank you.